my road trips are clearly cursed. I can't believe that this has happened again. And I don't mean by that the fact that I have a complete inability to park the Shmima Vail GT Black Series in this marked bay, which I'll explain in a second, because we are here in Donbass, a couple of hours from Oslo, spectacular scenery around, and about to embark on a journey to the Arctic Circle, taking a Nürburgring lap record supercar to the land of snow and frozen lakes via the famous Atlantic Ocean Road, somewhere I've always wanted to drive. However, we have technically not one, not one problem that I can't believe has come up again, but two. It's a bit of a joke from recent road trips and I need to explain and we need to get some things fixed along the way. You're probably wondering how have I managed to overshoot a parking bay by about two meters? Well, I will add that last night this was snow. You couldn't see the lines and there was a big van in the space next to us. So this seemed like the safest place to tuck it in beside the pillar, which is why it now looks a little bit stupid. It's a couple of degrees Celsius, so just above freezing point. This car is utterly Filthy. I mean, look at the dirt and grime and salt and all sorts of nastiness that is all over that bright solar beam yellow paintwork. In fact, I seem to be taking a little bit of... Yeah, let's, let's not do that right now. Let's save that for a, a proper wash later on. But it's locked and loaded for the journey ahead. This car has quite a few very cool memories under its belt. And in the next 40 miles or so, 60 or 70 kilometers, it's gonna hit a milestone. But over its lifetime so far, we've had it, for example, out in Romania at the Transfagorashan Highway, the famous Top Gear Road, and the neighboring Transalpina with all of its bears that we found along the way. It was out in the Middle East driving at Jebel Jace, this Formula One track style tarmac that sweeps up through the jagged mountains in the desert. It's also been in the United States driving through Death Valley in Nevada, the hottest place on earth. So amazing roads in Europe, in the Middle East, in America, and now another to add to the list is to head to the Atlantic Ocean Road, this sweeping section of highway that's a few decades old, linking some of the islands together over near Christiansund, and somewhere that for multiple reasons I've always wanted to go. What I didn't expect though was that we would have these two things to deal with along the way, which I shall get to shortly. Hi guys, I'm Shmi, hello, and welcome back to the channel where today we're taking the GT Black Series up towards the Arctic Circle. Let's get this journey started and warm up this car. It actually says it's six degrees Celsius right now, which is kind of pleasant. It also has 46,136 kilometers on it, which is relevant for something I'm going to tell you about in a moment. It is, however, utterly filthy. I mean, look at the passenger window and mirror. That is pure grime right now. So step one, right at this moment, while I try and avoid this pillar that I parked right next to, is to go and get some fuel, which we've actually been doing okay with so far. I was slightly concerned that out here we might struggle to find some good stuff, 98, but we seem to be doing fine. And because the roads are very, very gentle and the speed limits are very low, the fuel economy is actually insane. We've done about 500 kilometers and still have a quarter of a tank left. So one of the most, well, one of the highest mileage ranges I've had on a single tank, and we're not even empty, but I don't want to take any chances. So I believe there is a shell lurking around here somewhere that we can pop into. Oh, there's a tractor. Don't want to hit the tractor. This is not your normal kind of car to be driving on these salted, snowy roads. But hey, we've got the winter tires. And tires are going to be a big topic today but they seem to be doing us okay. So let's go get a full tank of fuel, hit the road and talk about this. This is a long journey ahead. A lot of this kind of view and a lot of the window getting absolutely ruined with dirt and grime and all sorts, but we do now have a full tank of fuel. It was only 95 at this stop, but what I'm gonna say about that is that when we were in the US, we figured that the car can run on lower fuel, lower grade fuel, so long as you're taking it pretty easy. And here in Norway, Speed limits are really low. A lot of the roads are 60 kilometers or 80 kilometers, 80 kilometers being about 50 miles an hour, because, well, firstly, it's cold, slippy, and icy. And secondly, you have moose, reindeer, and elks that pop out all over the place. So it's a long journey ahead. And believe it or not, this journey is going to be, well, filled with beautiful scenery, but also a total of about 1,200 kilometers, around 750 miles from here up towards our destination in Ayaplog, Sweden. We're gonna be crossing the border tomorrow, but in this video, as we go towards the AMG Driving Academy. But before that, we've got a whole lot of this, a whole lot of roads through amazing scenery, 
towards the Atlantic Ocean Road. I don't know exactly where we are, but that's definitely a ski resort and it looks amazing. Beautiful day. Yesterday it was snowing, so you've got fresh powder up there. And today the sky is nice and sunny, which is exactly what you want. We are now only seven kilometers shy of 46,199. That is the number I'm waiting for, 46199 for a special reason, a personal reason, but we're not far off now. I suppose I should probably explain this one a bit more and that's getting even dirtier. This thing is gonna be a complete mess by the end of this video. Stay tuned to see what happens. Although I tell you what, where we are right now with a bit of snow or rain or something sprinkling down and the road meandering into the distance, running alongside a thawing river, that's actually really cool to see, the way the ice is melting. There are some amazing views as we go about this journey, spectacular scenery, and it's only gonna get better as well. But this, and the, let's say, personal record or record amongst the Schmimobiles. If we wind back to my first ever car, a Renault Clio, a silver 1.2 litre, three door Clio Dynamique. I bought it back in summer 2005, almost two decades ago, on a total of eight miles. I sold it three years, three months later on 28,692 miles, meaning I drove it 28,684 miles. You can probably guess where this is going. This car I bought in July 2021, two years, eight months ago, on 23 miles. Add 23 miles to the mileage that I did in the Clio and you get 28,707 or 46,199 kilometers. That means it took 16 years from selling the Clio in September 2008 until now to have a new car that in the ownership that I've had with it has done more miles. After the Clio, I guess at that point I changed cars quite quickly and then I owned a fleet of cars. I always wondered if it might be the 675 LT Spider or whether it would be the G63 or whether it would be something else. But the GT Black Series has taken the crown. This is officially the car that I have owned that has done the most mileage in my life. And as cars go to have done that with an 850 horsepower, super limited, aggressive track monster like this is a pretty cool one to have done it with, especially given it's already been to three continents. I'm not gonna lie though, I'm getting pretty cold. Let's get back in the car, continue the drive. The weather has changed a fair bit since the last clip, but this is an interesting one for me because we're gonna catch one of these ferries. In fact, you can see them here. Basically the Norwegian fjords, right? That's quite cool. So this car is going on yet another ferry, unfortunately in some pretty nasty weather. I don't know how this works. Like, do we pay for it here or is it just charged like a toll? I think it's just charged like a toll. Looking at the camera system over overhead, you have to give your number plate on an electronic system. I literally think it's that and we wait here and in nine minutes we have a ferry. That's really easy. Gotta respect the Norwegians for everything being very organized. It is boarding time. I'm a little bit worried about this step that we have on though um, and how best to approach it. So let's go with a crazy wide angle to try and best get up there. Ah, oh, we're fine. Nothing to worry about. All good. Perfect. Smooth, well, smooth sailing, hopefully ahead of us. That was easier than I thought. This is a bigger ferry than I thought. Reminds me when we were in Croatia with the Zenvo on SOC. Oh, okay. Time to go get wet. Right, that was easy. We've made it to the other side. Out we go. I tell you one thing I do kind of appreciate is that everywhere you go in Norway, you gonna have a little scrape? No, we're good you can find a hot dog, so you can always get something to eat. There was quite a nice kiosk on that ferry, although it was windy and cold and pretty miserable, but the journey continues onwards, less than an hour to the Atlantic Ocean Road. This whole area is just unreal. The way that you have all of these different islands, many of which are connected by bridges, of course, some of which you need to take ferries, and some which have where we're headed to. But this is just amazing, even though the weather isn't great, it's still amazing to be here and just be able to look around and take it all in and to have brought this car somewhere a very long way away from home that I've been wanting to come for a very long time and we're now actually here. And sometimes you dip into a tunnel, which also feels a little bit strange to go under 
a bit at sea. My first glimpse of the road over there. It's in the distance where we're headed. It is a fascinating piece of tarmac. I, I can see it all. I can see the famous bit as well. Because basically, back in the 80s, the idea was mooted to build a rail track across here, in fact. They then went ahead and it opened in 1989. But to me, I've known people who have come and driven different driving tours and things here over recent years. But one thing really stood out about, I want to say five or six years ago, there was a video shot with Steve Sutcliffe driving a new Ford GT here. They were also going up to the Arctic Circle Raceway. But watching those clips of the Ford GT driving over the bridge, over the roads here, this whole connected eight kilometer sequence that heads over, and it's completely gone behind the trees now, was just the like, one day we need to come back here, we need to come and drive that road. And that's exactly what we're here for. So seeing it then, and now actually seeing it myself, because it's, if you look at it on a map, it's quite obscure the way this goes out, literally out into the Atlantic Ocean. And I've driven, you know, the Pacific Coast Highway, driven up the east coast of the US on the other side of the Atlantic, driven in the UK and Scotland and by the coast multiple times, but never up here. And this is about to be mega. I don't think it's gonna come back into sight until we get round towards the start of it. So not too far, another five minutes, and we should be up there ready to go check this out. Somehow we've got lucky and the sun has come out and I can now see the famous bridge we're about to drive over. But this is also not only famous for me from the Ford GT video, but also from the James Bond movie, No Time to Die. Bond is being chased down here by baddies and defenders, like we're all being chased by bad people on the internet. Now, while Bond has Q to come up with gadgets to help protect him, thanks to the sponsor of today's video, we have Surfshark to help protect us from baddies on the World Wide Web. It is extraordinarily windy here. That is the Atlantic Ocean. America is that way. Oh my gosh, this is quite extreme weather, but I tell you what, we're all being chased by baddies online, right? We all need to protect our data. And on a trip like this, we're on the road for a month, a month and a half. Along the way, I need to make payments. I need to update car documents. I need to book upcoming hotels and night stays. And of course, I wanna make sure my data is encrypted, which is why I'm always connected with Surfshark's VPN to make sure that nobody can snoop on my data. Nobody can be overlooking at what I'm doing and what I'm sending, which when you're on the road like this, is really quite important. I tell you what, with this wind, we're getting back in the car. The wind out there is insane. It's much nicer in the car, but you're probably familiar with geographic restrictions on so many things we do online. And that's where with Surfshark VPN, you can change your location. So as I often do for booking hotels and flights, you can set your location to get the best deal possible on your bookings. Not only that, sports content and updates. If you want to follow your favorite football team back at home, you might have access to extra content that's blocked from abroad. Also the likes of Netflix, being able to choose which content that you want to see by being able to change your location means that you can always get the best deal and the best access to what's out there. One of the best things is that you can use Surfshark VPN on unlimited devices, even a games console, or even share it with your friends. But shh, don't tell Surfshark I told you that. It looks for us though like the coast is clear, there are no villains in sight, and time to go check out driving the Atlantic Ocean Road, which means it is time for you guys to check out Surfshark VPN. What are you waiting for? There's a money back guarantee for 30 days, plus if you use my coupon code, you get three months for free as well. Talking about free, we're free to go. Let's go drive on this amazing piece of road I've been looking forward to. I'm not entirely sure what it is about this, which makes me really quite so excited, but being here and obviously this far from home and a place that I've seen in so many pictures and would be so easy to come and visit in the summer, to come here in June, July, when the weather's going to be good. Not when it's like this, and we've basically got a whole lot of salt water being splashed all around the car, but that is a different topic. I mean, look at this, the way the waves crash off the rocks down there to the left. Some pretty dramatic weather out there. And here are we driving up towards this part, the most famous part of this piece of tarmac that goes up and over. Ah, look at that. I had no idea it was so high up into the air. That is a cool, cool, cool bit of bridge. Look at this, up over the arch. Oh, that's mega. There have been some stunning photo shoots and things here over the years. And we're just cruising, obviously the car dropping down a gear to make it up. 
If only we had blue skies and beautiful sunshine, but yeah, here we are. Over the top of the Atlantic Ocean Road, look at this. Look at the way the road goes out in front of us across the islands. Oh, this is spectacular. I'm happy to be here today, and I've still not even told you about the two different problems that have come up, the two very repetitive problems that we have when we do these road trips. But, uh, yeah, this is cool. I mean, for some people, this is just the daily commute, this road, but it's been considered one of the like really special standout places in terms of engineering feet, in terms of the fact that it was built. It's incredibly scenic, and it just links these, I think, eight islands together so that you can get across in this direction towards Christiansen. Mega, just feels like completely alien. So surreal to be driving here. So completely surreal. We've been taking some photos, so we're back at this side of the bridge again, but the weather has become nasty. Hey, check out how he's floating. That's crazy, because the wind right now is quite frankly absurd. It says on the uh, weather forecast that it's about 60 kilometers an hour, um, which is what, 40 miles an hour, and I can believe it completely because it is horrific outside and I am absolutely drenched from just hopping out to take a few pictures. But even still, the view from up here is crazy. I mean, look at this. The waves and the sea is so choppy and aggressive and angry and just wild. Nature, hey, the oceans. You don't mess with them. Anyway, <laughs> let's continue our journey because we still have a good few hours ahead of us to get to our checkpoint for the evening in Trondheim, where we're actually gonna be able to resolve one of the two curses. We're gonna be able to resolve one of the two things that's gone very wrong with this car. Um, I just hope we're gonna make it safely through here right now. <laughs> it's actually crazy to be driving this close to waves that are splashing as aggressively, not sure if you can see down there, as they are. There is an elephant in the room though. The elephant in the room is the fact that that's salt water and <laughs> salt water in cars. Not the best mix given there's a lot of metal in these. Um, it is kind of life though and I believe in driving cars. Say no to garage queens, get the miles done. There are much bigger problems for this car than a little bit of salt. If something needs replacing down the line, then so be it. But by that point, it's gonna have done, I don't know, 100,000, 200,000 kilometers anyway. So it's not necessarily the biggest concern in the world. And it's well worth it for the memories, even though, I mean, look at this weather. It took a proper turn for the worse. This is a seriously bad day to have been here. I was being told that a couple of days ago, it was beautiful sunshine, still winds, like just perfect. Yeah, yeah, kind of got that a little bit wrong, but hey, special to be here regardless and to have driven over there. There's not a whole lot to see right now. We're in a tunnel, the Atlantic Tunnel. It's about five kilometers and 250 meters deep, which makes it one of the deepest tunnels in the entire world. That's quite ridiculous, like 750 feet under the water that takes you around to Christiansen. We actually had a bit of a traffic jam behind because this was closed and I was just starting to panic that it was going to be a very, 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 very long night. But luckily, moving again, just kind of literally out of nowhere, traffic started going. And look, the traffic coming towards us is now beginning as well. Good news, we're flowing. We're in and out of good and bad weather, but that's a cool bridge. That is a very, very cool bridge. It's not the way we're going though. This is all very confusing. When you hop between these islands, we are going this way, but that looks impressive. I need to find out more about how they decide between bridges, tunnels, and ferries. I, I don't know right now. I don't know without looking. This is fascinating. It's an electric ferry that we're now on. So yes, we're on another ferry. And up there is how it's gonna charge. So presumably it charges during the offload and reloading process. And they have these in the fjords up here. I was gonna not film the ferry because it's yet another ferry, but um, I found this really, really interesting. So is that about to line up and then plug itself in? How clever. I mean, makes sense. Norway kind of leads the world with these things. You see so many Teslas on the road as well. Like absolutely everywhere. Tesla, Tesla, Tesla. Two and a half hours though from where we are now to Trondheim for the night, which isn't too bad. And actually cars are going off already. So we better go. That took me by surprise. I wasn't ready for it at all. Do I go? Is it by row? I need to make sure. Oh, he said stop, 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 stop. Them. 
trucks, not us. I don't know. <laughs> I guess I can go that way. Off to the side we go, off to the side we go. Right, gotta watch the bumps. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm gonna have to just scrape, accept it. Oh, that sounded horrible. The undercar arrow. But hey, we're off. It could be worse. We are touchdown and go. A couple of hours later, we're in an underground garage in Trondheim. Come and have a look at this though, because this thing is literally like caked in this thin layer of grime and dirt. But I want to show you something else as we come past. Oh my goodness. Actually, look at that. Look at the roof line. I guess in some way here, you can kind of see what the arrow is doing, but it's literally like a thick layer of bleh all over it. However, this 911, 992 from the Netherlands is even dirtier, completely coincidentally. Look at that. Look at that. I wonder how much driving they've done with the roof down. Probably not a lot. That thing is absolutely filthy. Clearly, this is a good place to stop on the way up. Anyway, that means grab some bags out and prepare for maybe a challenge in the morning. Firstly, in the morning, we're going to go into the curse and the things that are wrong. Secondly, I've got an idea, but I might sleep on this and decide it's a really bad idea. So we'll go with the flow a bit. Anyway, yeah, mission success. We're here in Tron time for today. The journey continues in the morning. Good morning. We're about 15 minutes away from our hotel here at Deck Team Tiller, who have stepped in to solve the first of the two problems with this car. It's time to explain this because in recent months, I have had consistent road trip tire disasters. In fact, if we only go back to the last six months, because this car's had a couple before that, six months ago in October, when we collected the Dark Horse and did the full tour across the country, we went to Hennessy in Texas, and I might have got a bit carried away with donuts and shredded up my rear tires, and they weren't readily available. Then a little bit later in the same tour, when we were driving up to Utah with the Stradman to go to his place, we got a puncture in one of the rears on the Dark Horse. Again, it was basically a new tire, I had to plug that. Then the Zenvo picked up a puncture on a front tire later on in California. Then fast forward to the Pura Sangue tour in December, when driving through Belgium, we picked up a nail that we had to get fixed in Germany. A little bit later, we were in Monaco, and thanks to all of the building sites down in Monaco, we then picked up yet another one, which we had to get repaired before we could continue the journey home. Now, we're not even six months after being in the US with the Mustang and this car got one. In fact, it was while we were driving out of Hamburg, driving through building sites, so almost certainly a nail as a result of that. And we pulled over because the tire pressure warning lights had pinged on inside. And this tire had got a nail in it. This tire had a lovely bit of metal sticking out. And um, yeah, it was a case of what do we do? So I popped out some stories. In fact, the most viewed stories I've ever had on the Shmi 150 Instagram pages to figure out a plan because of course you can do a plug, a patch, a repair. And that's actually what we did at Deck Team in Oslo. When we got off the ferry up to Oslo, it was about a 20 hour ferry. So lots of time to figure out a plan. We then took it straight there, patched it. And in many cases, that would be fine. At slower speeds, not an issue. For normal everyday driving, not an issue. But this is where I want you to consider, firstly, the value of the car. Should anything go pop, go bang? Massive, massive, massive problem, a lot on the line. Secondly, the speed and performance, 850 horsepower, rear driven, and these tires have gone at 270 kilometers an hour, about 170 miles an hour when we're in Germany on the Autobahn. That's what they're rated to. And they will do that again. So I don't want to drive that fast on a repaired tire in a car of this value and with us inside it. Hence why with big thanks to Pirelli Norway, who managed to track down these fairly unusually sized tires, because they are, of course, incredibly wide, Pirelli Soto Zeros. We have a pair waiting for us inside the workshop to pop onto this. So I guess it's time to pull the car in, figure out how to do this, I guess, with incredibly dirty wheels and get them changed, get some new ones and get ready to hit the road for the 700 kilometers or so from here, just without being cursed by any more punctures, I hope. <laughs> Around here, we have the goodies. Now it's quite important with these things to have the right tires. The MO is the official Mercedes stamp. These are the ones made for this exact car. They are fully homologated, fully registered, fully correct, which you want when you're driving properly. Winter tires like this, these are kind of, 
I don't know how to describe it, the winter tires that suit a high performance car. You can obviously get studded tires, which we're going to be talking more about later on on this trip. You can also get more extreme winter tires, but obviously it's a performance car, hence why we have these. You've got all of these extra grooves which help when you're driving over soft snow, soft pack stuff and that kind of thing. Very different profile to what you have on the summer tires for the Black Series. But yes, if Pirelli Norway hadn't managed to track these down for me, <laughs> I don't really think the rest of the tour would have been the same. Of course, we could drive, but it wouldn't be the same. Now, it's all relative because on the Puro Sangue, when we had the puncture, we did a repair. We repaired that tire. It's still got a repaired winter tire. It's currently back on the... No, it's not yet back on the summer tires, but it will be back on its summer tires. And the winter will just always have been one that was repaired. But with this, knowing what's coming and also knowing the age of the ones that are on it, because those are about five years old, it doesn't make sense to keep them. It makes a lot more sense to put a new one on. The guys here are immediately cracking on with that, but you might be wondering, why is the right one off as well? I'll explain that in a second, because firstly, this is getting a little bit rusted. Obviously that happens with use and mileage, and it means that the wheels are a right faff to get off. And we had the exact same problem when I did this with Brad at the Museum to swap from the summer wheel set that I have to the winter wheel set. Obviously it is the same problem over on this side. So we'll give those a little clean up before popping the wheels back on. The locking wheel nut obviously was tucked in here. So we had to take out a whole ton of luggage to get to it. But the reason for doing both of these at the same time is that again, high performance car, you always basically want to change tires in a pair, a matched pair. So on the same axle, you have new tires at the same time. With those aging, both in terms of years, but also in terms of mileage, because they've covered in this, what, around six or 7,000 kilometers already, it's basically a no-brainer to change them both at the same time, to start afresh with a new set on the back, because let's be real, it's an expensive car. We want to look after it and they will have more longevity in terms of usage and time from this point going forwards. You will notice we have wheels back on and they are oddly clean compared to the rest of the car. The reason for that is actually to do with balancing. Wouldn't necessarily think about this, but all the dirt buildup would impact that. So they were cleaned, popped the new tires on. Obviously they've now been balanced, tucked back down. Um, need to be final torque now that it's been lowered back to the ground and then we'll be good to go and get these filthy again in no time at all. We're on the move, we are ready to go. New tyres and no reversing camera that works, but <laughs> we'll figure it out. See you later. Off we go and there is a Gallardo by the way, also in for some work. The tire stores here are massive because obviously people have summer tires and winter tires. It's kind of a funky wrap, that person satin sheen that it has. So we are going to a petrol station around the corner because I know we can get some 98. And this poses an interesting question. Today's journey is a smidge over 700 kilometers. I think, I've never done it, that this car could potentially do that on one tank. The most I have ever managed out of it is not even 600 kilometers, but the speeds you drive here are so gentle and slow that it should be doable. It should be possible. We shall see. So let's go. While we're heading out of Trondheim with these views, and I'm sure we're gonna have a lot of amazing views today, just at the moment by some of the sea and lakes and things that you have in this region. Although it's gonna head more inland very quickly. We're actually gonna head past the ski resort of Aura. And I've actually driven this route before, about 10 years ago. I say driven, I've been in a shuttle bus that did this route about 10 years ago to go ice driving with BOTB. Anyway, it's quickly become a hypermiling challenge. So at the moment, we're 20 kilometers into this tank and we have a range of 660 to empty, which would be 680 kilometers, which is ridiculous. That is a good, I want to say 425 miles. I've never done over 350 miles on a tank between fill-ups in this car. And we might be about to try for 700 kilometers. Maybe, if we're brave enough. Let's see, because when we get towards the later stages of this is when it's going to be really hard to find any petrol stations. I don't really know what we're in store for, but we're just going to try it. So at the moment, we're heading towards Aura. Uh, when we get there, that will probably be about time right for a lunch stop and then we'll figure out what's happening and how it looks and whether we might be able to do this. Things have just got a whole lot more dramatic. Look at this weather as we're actually very quickly approaching the border to Sweden, which will be another new country for this car um, and the conditions. It is positive. One degree Celsius. There it is. 
that will be us into Sweden for today. Another new country for the GT Black Series and interesting conditions, very dirty conditions. This car is gonna be such a mess at the end of this. What crazy, crazy places to be driving though at this time of year. It's total madness, to be honest. And I'm still on my hyper mile. So we're 107 kilometers in now and we have 584 to go. So that would be about 700-ish if we are able to keep it slow and steady and gentle the whole way. It's, it's the day for it. You know, like you look at this, we're not about to be driving hard and it's gonna be like this the whole way. So I might as well just take it easy, nice and chill. The sun's poking through. Our winter wonderland. Oh, I love it. This is so cool being here <laughs> in this car. Look at this. That's really cool, actually. We crossed the border into Sweden and all of a sudden the gray gloom starts to vanish, but the salt on the road, like I said earlier, might not be good for the car, but say no to the garage queens. These cars are made to drive. Fast forward and we are a couple of hours further north and this is pretty much what everything is like now. Literally a snow paradise, winter wonderland. But I want to tell you about the second part of the curse of the GT Black series. The second thing that seems to keep going wrong. The thing that you know about if you saw the United States tour, you know about if you followed the home ball adventure back from Romania after Gumball 3000. And that is of course the fate of the windscreen. And I'm not sure if you can see it, but here is a small chip but then with a crack that's about one and a half centimeters long here, it's kind of hard to see. That's possibly repairable. I, I'm, I'm not actually measured it. It's possibly yet another windscreen. It seems to happen. And I think the reason for that is that it's actually quite a vertical windscreen. Most cars would have a more raked piece of glass, but because of the look of the very front, very low, long front bonnet, it's a recipe for disaster. There are multiple things you could do. One, you could put a film on it, but when you're running the washer jets every, well, literally seconds <laughs> to keep the window clean, I mean, look at it, you would have your wiper motors burn out very quickly as well. So you can't go down that path. The alternative is just to accept the feet and we just accept the feet and fortunately can change it and change it and change it because it had one when it was being repainted. It had one when it was in America, well, it had it when it got back to Europe, one after the Romania trip, and now we've had another one. So it'll be its fifth window that this car has had. Tires and windows, not the best, but this journey's going well, and we've only got, what is it gonna be, about five hours to go into the night to get to Ayuplog? Let's continue. As you can see, the light is starting to go down, and we still have hours to go ahead of us, and we've heard reports of reindeer ahead. So I'm hoping that's not gonna be a problem, but also, we're almost a thousand kilometers on already from when this car became the most driven Schmiemobile. But also you'll see we're 460 kilometers in, 250 kilometers to go. And as we slow down for a speed limit section on here, 275 kilometers, 276 kilometers of the journey. So that means at the moment we have a 23 kilometer buffer to get to Ayaplog based on the car. And remember these things, there should be a buffer. There should be more, there should be more spare fuel than it tells us. But what I also expect is that as we get closer to empty, that will go down faster than the distance. So it's gonna be a game of chance. We're gonna see, and we've driven the entire journey at the speed limit. So in the 100 sections, I'm driving at 100 or at least an indicated 100. So if I went 90, it would go further. I just think you should only really do this at the speed limit. Otherwise you just sit at like 70 kilometers an hour and 100 and cause annoyance and get in the way and your journey takes a very long time. So wish us luck. Update coming later when we're hopefully a bit clearer on what it's gonna be. It is really dark here, as you can see. It is also minus three degrees Celsius. And obviously with the constant fear of black ice, or an animal jumping out from somewhere. However, let me update you on the numbers on the dashboard and hopefully the camera's focus hasn't gone totally wrong here. We are 617 kilometers into this tank, currently with 93 to go. So we will get through 700 if on this screen, the range is 107. So 93 to go, 107 to empty. We're actually on the fuel light at the bottom. 
but in theory that is 14 kilometers spare so <laughs> we're about to go past the last fuel station i think it's literally in the next little town and uh wish us luck that is the last petrol station and we're 90 kilometers away about 60 miles but we're gonna go straight past i hope this works what you see now on the screen is not zero but where it stops telling you the number and it was reading about five kilometers over the 72 kilometers we now have so slightly nervy but uh, as we go uphill here and the consumption numbers rise they're in liters per 100 kilometers the european way uh but yeah fingers crossed <laughs> let's see one very big milestone that we're about to reach in the middle of nothingness if you can see on the dashboard is that that was 700 kilometers on one tank in this car and we still have the slimmest sliver of fuel left apparently luckily it's only 10 kilometers to go so fingers are still crossed but it should be all good i'm pleased to report that we're in the town of ayaplog which well it's been a long time but we still have one and a half kilometers to the petrol station and we're on zero we've been on complete zero since it was about seven kilometers to go and there are some speed bumps and roundabouts and junctions between us and there not a lot but a couple potentially we just had one speed bump like here for example i can see a truck coming from the left but if i can roll through here i absolutely want to roll through here so uh we're gonna do it and roll out and make it work and got to watch for that as well because of course it is still slippy season it is winter but one kilometer one kilometer gently does it very gently does it must be up here somewhere i think we're going to be good worst case we can now walk <laughs> absolute worst case if they have a jerry can which they might not but this is a car town because a lot of people do winter testing up here so what are we on 709.3 kilometers less than a kilometer less than a kilometer to go 709.4 i'm gonna play with fire here that's a petrol station on the right but i believe that doesn't have 98 no it's not it's now a fish shop it was a petrol station that's our petrol station on the left up there it's an ionity charger though it's fast charging if you need it anyway this is where we're coming to and i am going to figure out how to swing into it probably this way and just make my way in, gently does it. Nice, easy cruise. Are we gonna successfully make it to the pump with 98 here in Aya Plug with the GT Black Series? That is absolutely, I'm at the wrong pump. That's the one with 100. <laughs> That's actually quite funny. Um, can we, not 100, 98, you know what I mean. Can we get round, can we get round? Are we gonna be good, are we gonna be good? That, ladies and gentlemen, is quite phenomenal. 710.3 kilometers and we're off. We've done it, we did it. That's insane. Right, I'm gonna have to fill up, calculate it, because I wanna know exactly what we just did. The amazing relief is that we've done it and I will calculate in a moment what it was. Let's reset the trip. There's a crowd of people here. So now that we're not about to run out of fuel, <laughs> We can give everyone a little, uh... To the hotel we go. Last little leg. We made it and I'm not gonna worry about fuel anymore. Oh, that's a nice little slide we've got going on there. A lot of it. <laughs> I'm pleased to say we're here at the AMG garage. There's actually gonna be a whole lot more coming. But before that, I think we need to celebrate the success of this journey and very conveniently is a large open area. Give me a second. We have made it. We are very late for dinner, so we're going to throw this in the garage. And then when we're in our hotel room, I'm going to go through some of these numbers because I need to calculate that. What a journey. But what's ahead of us is actually going to be even more fun. I have crunched the numbers. So 710.3 kilometers is just over 441 miles, which is about 100 miles more than the most I've done previously in that car, which in UK MPG, and I appreciate UK, US is actually a different number. In UK MPG is 27.9 miles per gallon, 
which is ridiculous for an 850 horsepower supercar. Now, I'm not gonna lie, we were a bit probably overly cautious at the end because when I filled it up, it's clocked off at 71.8 liters on a 75 liter tank. That probably means there's another like 30 or 40 kilometers to get out of that before it would actually be gone, plus the reserve and what's in the system. So I tell you what, that was a fun little challenge, even if it was slightly nerve wracking. It's been amazing to drive up to where we are now, and I can't wait for the fun that we're about to have and testing different things. The curse of the car has obviously carried forwards. Another puncture, another bit of broken windscreen, but hey, it's a car for driving. Those are consumables, they can be repaired. There are potentially a few other things on it that we might have noticed they're going to need some repairs as well to do with driving over a whole lot of snow and a whole lot of dirty roads and junk and grime but that's not a problem for right now a big thanks to the team well deck team in tilla who helped do the tire swap to pirelli norway who figured out how to solve this problem and of course to the team up here for what's coming next that's it for this time though thank you very much for watching guys i hope you've enjoyed this journey clocking up the miles over a thousand kilometers in the gt black series past the atlantic ocean road to trondheim and across now to Ayaplog here in sweden i'm going to take a good rest tonight and be back with you very soon. Cheers!